Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> again, um, uh, tonight we want to begin the second half of chapter two. Uh, tonight we want to be talking, uh, we'll be discussing uh, destroying the wall to build the temple. And uh, you'll see both wall and temple in this uh, section of chapters, verses 11 through 22. And you'll begin to understand Swindoll's um, reason for using this as a title. So with that being uh, said uh, tonight, um, as we look at an overview of, of, of chapter two, because uh, Paul is likening or likens the church to a temple. Uh, Paul reviews uh, the what, the why, and the how concerning this spiritual temple of salvation. So a quick outline of chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 22, it kind of falls like, down like this. Um, outline uh, is, is somewhat similar to this as we uh, ask ourselves the question of what, why, and how. So what are what were we once, okay? We were dead in sin. We were influenced by Satan. We were under God's wrath. We were pagans without God. We were separated from Christ, and we were we were without hope in this present world. That is what we once were. What God did for us is that God loved us, God liberated us, and certainly God lifted us. These are the verses that speak to that, uh, to that particular outline. Why did God do it? Well, God did it so that he might display us as a trophy of his grace. He would put us out there for all the world to see. Uh, that his uh, grace is sufficient. How God did it is in the following uh, examples and verses. Through his special favor, through, his, through, through faith, uh, we know it's through the blood of Jesus. What were we now or what, what, we, what we are now, <laughs> having undergone what God has done, uh, we are the products of grace. We are partners with Israel. We are the people of God. And certainly we are the pillows of this new temple. And so as we look at the second half of uh, chapter two, uh, Paul wants Gentiles to remember how far they have come. Uh, courtesy, courtesy of Jesus Christ. We, we are who we are only because of what Christ has done on our behalf. Once strangers from the promise made to Israel, and we were without God in this world, Gentiles can now draw near through the blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad about that? That we have uh, the ability to uh, come uh, humbly before the Lord. Uh, so by his death on the cross, uh, Jesus abolished the law of commandments, uh, which separated Jew from Gentiles, and, and he has reconciled them both to God in one body, which is the church. That is, the Gentiles can therefore be fellow citizens and members of God's family, uh, that they are also part of that grand temple being built upon uh, the foundation of the apostles and, and the prophets that went before us, whereby this temple, whereby Jesus is the cornerstone in which they serve as a habitation of God in the spirit. And so Paul is painting a picture, a mental picture of a temple being built, uh, not the old temple, because the imagery is 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 just that um, um, a vivid, not the temple in Jerusalem, but a new temple whereby Jesus is the 
uh, is the chief cornerstone of this new building. Uh, so Swindoll uses the title in his commentary, destroying the wall that divided us in order to build the temple, uh, as I add the words, to unite us, okay? So for nearly, and again, uh, Swindoll always start his, his lesson with a illustration. And uh, I debated again whether, whether I should add it, but I think it kind of helps us set these mental understandings of the text that's going forward. So please bear with me. Uh, but he says in, the, in his commentary that for nearly half a century, the Iron Curtain split e uh, uh, Europe into East and West. The separation was physical, it was political and spiritual. Physical from the standpoint that a heavy militarized uh, border cut like an ugly jagged scar from the Baltic Sea in the North to the Adriatic Sea in the South. Politically separated, it separated the communist East from the capitalist West. A division epitomized by the infamous Berlin Wall splitting East Berlin and West Berlin and spiritually divided where the Iron Curtain served as a seemingly impenetrable barrier to the gospel, blocking the atheistic communist nations from the encroaching influence of Christianity. So from 1945 to 1989, the Iron Curtain literally separated families, friends, nations, languages, resulting in empathy, enmity, animosity, distrust, and fear. But in 1989, a minor miracle occurred. Just two years after US President Ronald Reagan stood before the Berlin Wall and challenged his Soviet counterpart, Mikhail Gorbachev, to tear down this wall, citizens from both East and West Berlin were permitted to demolish the barrier and reunite the once divided people. Amidst tears of joy and days of celebration, the Iron Curtain was lifted from Germany, marking the beginning of a new era in modern European history. As much as the fall of the Berlin Wall made an, an unforgettable mark on the men and women who witnessed it, this historical, this historical event cannot compare to the epic moment when Jesus Christ tore down another wall, one that had separated humanity for centuries. Though the wall had been meant to preserve God's Jewish people from moral and spiritual corruption, as they represented their God before the nations, it quickly became a divider that alienated the Gentiles who were meant to receive God's blessings through the Jewish nation. And the law of Moses and the sacrificial system that marked God's path of holy living for the Jews Yet Gentiles stood outside the gate, aliens to the promise, foreigners to the covenant, and dejected outcasts from the knowledge of God. And so what Swindoll is giving us here is this grand photograph of a mental uh, picture of what the Berlin Wall did and the Iron Curtain did uh, to separate East from the West from uh, communists, from capitalism, um, there was this wall that separated Jews from Gentiles. And he says, all that changed when Christ tore down the wall and began building a new temple. So we saw in the first part of our, 
our letter to the Ephesians, Paul sharply contrasts our former lives, lives as unbelievers, that we were once dead and trespasses in sin there in, in uh, chapter, chapter two, verse, verse one. Um, <clears throat> uh, he says that, um, um, and he says, you have he quickened who were dead and trespasses in sin there in the King James. He says, but with our new lives, he says, as those made alive together with Christ, beginning in verse four, he says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, have quickened us or brought back to life, brought us together with Christ by, the, by grace, you are saved. Aren't you glad about that? So now Paul turns to another contrast between the Jews and the Gentiles. This time, however, he describes in vivid language how the deep gulf that had once separated these two people have been bridged by the finished work of Jesus Christ upon this new level foundation of equality, a new temple, which is the church is being built, which will then certainly encompass both Jew and Gentile. So we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. This is for the, this is for all uh, Gentiles. We are, we are being added in um uh to the family of god we have been rescued there is a there is a reconciliation that is ongoing because or through jesus christ and so and so tearing down the wall that separates allows god to build or christ specifically to build this new temple which is called the church so as we look at tonight's uh, verses, uh, starting in verse 11, chapter two, verse 11 to 12, he says, therefore, this is NIV, he says, uh, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. He says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in this world. <laughs> we were miserable. So Paul begins by describing the common plight of the uncircumcision, that is the Gentiles. The condition that all Gentiles uh, experienced prior to their conversion to Jesus Christ, at least from the perspective of the circumcision, of those who were circumcised, that is those Jews marked by the physical sign of this old covenant handed down all the way back to, uh, back to Moses. Um, in that, covenant symbolism, um, Paul will remind us uh, going forward that is not the outward circumcision, but the circumcision of the heart that God is going to be concerned with going forward. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to those verses um, later on and we'll talk about that. So here in verses 11 and 12, it describes the lives of the Gentiles before the reconciling work of the cross. Note, if you will, that the words Paul uses to describe the Gentiles' former relationship to God and his promises. That is, we were separated, we were excluded. He calls us strangers. One, play, one translation used foreigners. We had no hope. We were without God. And so Paul identifies five aspects of the alienation his Gentile readers experienced prior to their salvation 
through Jesus Christ. Number one, we were Christless. We had no Messiah. Gentiles in the first century had no thought of the Messiah. Only the Jews had hoped for a savior foreshadowed first in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman would bring forth um, a, 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 a child and he will bruise the head of Satan. The Jews knew he would come from among his own people, okay? So they looked forward to the coming son of David who would save them from their sins. And the Gentiles, however, had no claim on the coming anointed king. They were impervious to his coming. So not only were we Christless, but we were stateless. We had no nation. There was no connection. There was no land uh, to speak of. That's what stateless is being referred to here. So being excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, the Gentiles had no right of citizenship in God's chosen nation. As the only true theocracy on earth, Israel's ultimate king was God himself. And he ruled his people through his covenants, uh, his laws, his prophets, the priests, and eventually the kings. The Gentiles were foreigners to God's nation. Not only that, but we were friendless. <laughs> when God established his covenant with Abraham, um, uh, the patriarch of the Hebrew people were referred to as God's friend or friend of God. As heir of God's covenant promises, the descendants of Abraham also enjoyed that special friendship with God. And we too now, amen, even sing a song. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> All of our sins in griefs to bear. So through the land covenant, explained in these verses here, uh, the Davidic covenant in 2 Samuel and the promise of a new covenant in Jeremiah 31, God unfolded this special relationship with the Jewish people. However, Gentiles, strangers to the promises of God, had no part in these covenants. Hallelujah. Not only that, but they were also hopeless. With no savior, no home, and no promises, the Gentiles had no meaningful future because the promises rested with the Jewish Messiah they couldn't expect their situation to improve, either in this life or in the life to come. They were faced with the same conclusion that Satan faced in Milton's uh, work called Paradise Lost. Thus repulsed, our final hope is flat despair. There was nothing to lift our spirits because we had no hope. And then fifth and final, the Gentiles were godless. So though the Gentiles honored and worshiped many gods, idols, if you will, none of these lifeless gods could save them from their hopeless condition of spiritual death. Only the living God of Israel could give them what they really needed and that is life from death. So Paul is writing to the Ephesians. He says, remember you Gentiles in the flesh, you were called the uncircumcised or the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. So there was this division and we saw this in, in, in when we studied the book of Romans, how Paul labors uh, uh, to write uh, hope and, and, and uh, uh, unity in that letter to the Roman church because he realized there were both Jews and Gentiles 
uh, Christians uh, worshiping together in Rome. And he did not want one to offend the other. And, and he oftentimes talks about being uh, on one accord and being together in the spirit, allowing the spirit, the Holy Spirit to lead, guiding, direct them together uh, in their time of worshiping uh, in the same church, in the same body. Uh, verses 13 and 14 says, but now in Christ, uh, but now, it, 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 but now is as good as but God. <laughs> uh, Paul oftentimes uses this but now or now that um, uh, as an expression um, uh, uh, going forward. But now, as it's also in both the King James and the NIV, he says, but now. Um, in, G in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier or the dividing wall of hostility. Uh, the way King James says, has broken down the middle wall of petition between us. So now we can, um, um, you know, have a, a, a uh, without barriers, without any obstruction, uh, interacting one with the other in a positive way. So like a tidal wave smashing against an immovable cliff, the unrelenting waves of hopeless despair are broken on the second of Paul's famous contrast, cr contrasts, this but now uh, here in verse 13. Having described the Gentiles' common plight before coming to Christ, Paul reveals the curse, I'm sorry, the cure, excuse me, Paul reveals the cure uh, for the plight, which is the cross of Jesus Christ. Everything centers on the cross. Everything revolves around Jesus' sacrifice. Everything is made new uh, by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. All things look to the cross or re are reconciled uh, through the cross or by the death of Christ on the cross. So Christ first brought the far off Gentiles near to him. He made it possible by the hopeless and helpless uh, of, of, of every age from the first century to the 21st century and certainly beyond to, to, to give them the ability to approach Christ through faith. By the blood of Jesus Christ, his death in our place, he died in our stead. He died as a substitution for us, dying in our place. God has provided our means of reconciliation. That is considering the numerous, but now we experience through Christ. Yeah, we once were, we, and, and it was true we were. These things, we were lost in trespasses and sin. We were called the children of disobedience. We were alienated from and we were separated by. But now, <laughs> I don't want to hear what I used to be. But now, in Christ, through, through his shed blood, we have been given the blessed ability to keep on going. We were once Christless. But now we are in Christ. We were once stateless, but now we are full citizens. We were once friendless, but now we are members of God's family. We were once hopeless, but now we are promised a glorious future. We were once godless. But now we can call God 
Abba, our Father. And all of this is because we were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Aren't you glad about that? Verse 13, we've been made, uh, we, we, we've been drawn nigh, we've made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Verse 13, uh, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So in short, when Jesus Christ paid the penalty for the sin of all humanity, Jew and Gentiles alike, the wall of separation crumbled. Christ himself and Christ alone is our peace, our tranquility, uh, the agent by which we have been given um, uh, access into uh, the presence of the Lord. Uh, we who were subject to the wrath of God has now been uh, uh, deemed forgiven and therefore we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, being justified uh, by grace. We have peace with our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so Christ has bestowed this gift upon us by grace alone, through faith alone. So, 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 so we see this glorious truth that Christ alone is the peace personified, that centuries earlier, Isaiah prophesied that the promised child born of the family of David would be called the Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor, uh, mighty God, the everlasting father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9 and 6. And through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, every believer shares a common union of peace with each other whether we be Jew or Gentile, male or female, black, white, Asian, or Hispanic, whether we be rich or poor, educated or uneducated, be you strong or weak, we have a common unity of peace because of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And Jesus himself has become our peace, right there in verse 14. Hallelujah, for he is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition. Here Paul mentions the barrier of the dividing wall that has been broken down by Christ. He likely had in mind the dividing wall that separated Jews from Gentiles in that massive temple complex constructed by Herod in the first century uh, BC. There on the Temple Mount, there was the court of the Gentiles. In other words, there was a barrier that prevented Gentiles from coming uh, into the, uh, the more sacred places of the temple on that Temple Mount. The Gentiles uh, in the time of the Romans had built, a, had built the Antonia Fortress so if you ever see a map of uh, Israel that, that outlines the Temple Mount and show you the wall around the temple or the uh, structure of the, of the temple itself, you'll notice that the Antonio, Fort, Antonio Fortress was abutted right up against the wall. So, uh, and, it, and it was like five to six stories tall so that the Roman soldiers could go in and go up into the higher towers of the fortress and look down into the court, courtyard of the Temple Mount. They were not permitted to go in there without inciting a riot. Um, but, um, and so the Romans gave them that privilege, even though the, the Jews were seg uh, subjugated 
at that particular time. The Romans gave them that uh, that 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 privilege of having that separated area exclusive exclusively for them. But but Rome still wanted to keep a check on what they were doing. So the Gentiles could look down at the temple from afar, but prejudice, prejudicial uh, customs and strict temple law, the thick walls and stern notices prevented non-Jews from getting any closer. So when Paul said that Christ broke down the dividing wall, he meant that the covenant of the law that formed the basis of such cultural and religious distinctions was no longer in force. That in Christ, the separation between Jew and Gentile had been rendered obsolete. And so Christ broke down, he is breaking down the wall that separates He's breaking down the wall in order to build a new temple we call the church. In verse 15 and 16, he says, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its common, I'm sorry, commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility or their enmity, okay? So Christ's sacrificial death on the cross abolished the enmity, the hostility or the division that promoted the hostility. And this term indicates the opposite of friendship. Here, Paul defines the enmity as the law of the commands containing in the ordinances. That is what brought the hostility between Jew and Gentile, what the law of Moses was uh, expounding um, and, 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 and caused this, this better than the, the Jews to have this uh, uh, more, uh, more better than you attitude or this exclusive um, uh, privileged attitude of quote unquote, the chosen uh, people of God. But, uh, but it was those commandments that, 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 that uh, caused this division. So it says by setting aside in his flesh, the laws along with its commands and its regulations, the law of Moses. He says, in fact, the cross of Jesus Christ has put enmity to death. Uh, he, he himself has killed death. Death itself, hell, death, and the grave also has, uh, has been uh, uh, defeated. Uh, well, death is the, is the final final enemy. It still has authority right now, but in the future, when Christ comes the second time, even death will have no authority. Aren't you glad about that? <laughs> On the other side, and so this breaking down, it's broken down, it's abolished, put to death. These are the terms. Paul uses to describe the Old Testament law of Moses. All the laws and the commandments, ordinance, rules, and regulations that have both uh, condemned us before God and separated us from his people have been done away with. No wonder Paul can confidently proclaim in Romans 10 verse 4 that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Thank you, Jesus. Christ is the end of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. We need no law if we have within us the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, uh, so, so though we are under the law of Christ, that is empowered 
to live like him by the spirit. This is what it says in uh, what he told the Galatians uh, back when we studied in the Galatians. We are no longer to keep the law of Moses because we're under the law of Christ. Again, if you have the love of Jesus, by this shall all men, women know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, uh, if you love God uh, and love your neighbor with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, again, these are the commandments that destroy the Mosaic law. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Paul doesn't merely point out what the cross has negatively accomplished by destroying the old religious system of the law, Paul emphasizes what has positively, positively taken place by the reconciling or the reconciling work of Christ. Yes, the cross did these things and destroyed the old, but it has also brought us into a state of reconciliation one with the other, Jew and Gentile, we have peace that both can be reconciled together, not only to God the Father, but to, to, to one another. Uh, we need not be separated uh, over the differences uh, that we find are, are, are really minor uh, in differences that we have blown out of proportion and declare them to be uh, so irreconcilable. We have reconciliation. Therefore, having broken down the wall that has separated Jew and Jews and Gentiles, God now calls members of both group into the church, which is a new work. Um, uh, this whole idea of, of, of Christian uh, those who were in Antioch were called Christians there first, that this understanding that there is this new ecclesia, a called out assembly, what the word church means, that we are, we are called out saints, we are, we're separated from this new work completely and distinct from Israel. Um, uh, this ain't, this is not the Old Testament temple, this is not Herod's temple, this is not Solomon or, or Zerubbabel's temple that we're talking about, this new structure is not even a building, uh, a brick of mortar. It is not a building. It is flesh and blood. Uh, this new temple that Christ uh, is, has given his life for. Paul describes the church as the body of Christ, as one new man, as he says in in verse uh, verse 15, he's likening it uh, having flesh and blood that we might come to understand that now that we are uh, in this new reconciled relationship uh, there in verse, verse uh, 15, uh, he says that uh, to make in himself of the two, one new man. Uh, he's joining the two Jew and Gentile together into one new uh, uh, Christian, uh, if I can use that expression, or church to define our involvement in Christ Jesus. Put another way, Jesus didn't uh, Greekify the Jews or Jewishify, Jewify the Greeks. Okay, nor did he create a hybrid people called Greek Grews, Grews, a combination of Jews and Greeks, Jew, Grews rather, nor did he create any uh, jerks, jerks, jerks. <laughs> I can't even, I can't even pronounce it. Uh, you, you, you can pronounce it, Jacqueline. Jeeks. Jeeks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I mean, and this is Swindoll uh, being humorous, and I appreciate his humor. Uh, but but again, the point is that just like Jesus, Jesus not a a a amalgamation of uh, of, uh, of, of 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 divinity and humanity uh, being melted together in a new hybrid. No, Jesus still 
uh, a God and he is still man, he's still hum human, but it becomes now a new creature and he makes you and I new creatures in him. And when we are translated, when we, when we put on our mortality, when we put on our incorruptible, we're gonna become just like him. Flesh and blood is going to go away and we shall be like him possessing the incorruptible body of the resurrection whereby Jesus is defined as the first fruit. So rather Paul now explicitly states that God made one new man from the two groups and that one man or that one new man is the church. And, and the church is the body of Christ of which Christ is the head of the church. In this way, unity has become accomplished and peace has been established. And so all of this was done that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross whereby Christ put death putting to death the enmity or the hostility or the animosity that, ex that previously existed between Jew and Gentile. So here, as we close on these verses, he came and preached peace to you who were afar away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and raised to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are now built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Aren't you glad about that? <laughs> Wow, Jesus came and preached peace to us. Peace I give unto you, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world giveth, I give it to you, but I give you peace. And that peace we know passes all understanding. Here Paul concludes chapter two by explaining the peace between Jews and Gentiles based on their shared calling. And he describing this new dwelling together in one community of the spirit. So as Paul continues to explain this new unity we have found in Christ, he identifies ways in which God's people would change as a result of the demolition, uh, the demolition rather of the dividing wall and the building of a new structure. All of these changes centered on a profound theological truth called reconciliation. He has given us the spirit of reconciliation by which God, that, that Christ was in the world reconciling the world back to God. Having been reconciled to God, both Jews and Gentiles are also reconciled to each other. Aren't you glad about that? And so how did Jesus reconcile God's chosen community, the Jews, with those outside of it, the Gentiles? The Bible says, by embodying and proclaiming peace. You can only conquer hate through love. You cannot destroy hate with more hate. Hallelujah. You cannot bring peace 
uh, by continuing to, to, to foster hostility. Somebody needs to embrace peace. And Jesus Christ preached the peace because he is the Prince of Peace. This peace is made real in our lives through the proclamation of peace. That's what he's been preaching to us to which we were afar off as well as to those that were near. With the, with the means of salvation in place, this message of salvation can be proclaimed and it can be offered to both Jews and Gentiles. And as we see in, in verse 17, Paul applies for us Isaiah 57, 19 to the present proclamation of the gospel. That is both personally and through his apostles, Christ preached peace, both to those who were afar away, as well as those who were, who were near. That, that he was no respecter of persons, but that he would call all who would listen that those that had an ear to hear could come and listen. Notice that both groups must hear and they must respond to the gospel in order to be reconciled to God and to each other. Th uh, 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 though the Jews were near, that is in the sense of having heard the prophecies, heeded the scriptures and anticipated the fulfillment of the promises, these alone were not enough to save them, okay? Uh, they had to respond to that gospel. So like everybody else, the Jews needed to trust in Christ alone by faith alone for their salvation. Nobody can be grandfathered into the church. Mm -hmm. You can't get there on what mama did. You can't get there on what grandfather did, okay? God does not have grandchildren, by the way. All of us are first generation children of God. You are a child of God. You're, there's no such thing as a grandchild of God, okay? And therefore, none can of I, us- Can I ask you a question here? Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't know if I wanna ask the question or if I wanna make a statement. Go ahead, make a statement, okay. Um, as we're talking about how we get into the church, the, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that we, we also don't join the church. <laughs> we are born again. That places us into the church as new creatures in Christ. So, okay. so, so, to, so unless we are born again, it doesn't matter how many times we walk the aisle. Now you're talking about the physical church or you're talking about this, the, the mythical church that Jesus is talking I'm talking about? about the church that Jesus is building here, but we have our different denominations and our different, the, the church, the church visible universal. Or invisible. The invisible, the church universal is, we are born into the church, not, not that we join the church, okay. but through the, through the new birth, we come into the church. And, and that was what my question or statement, I don't know how, yeah. what I'm saying. So okay. I, I just wanted to kind of, you know, throw I'll that elaborate. a little bit, okay? Okay. And, and, and again, Jesus is not talking about a brick and mortar uh, temple, nor is he talking about a brick and mortar church. This is the this is the universal or what we call the invisible church, okay, which has its manifestation on earth and the gathering of the people the church is the people and wherever they gather it is called the assembly and even though we might go to somebody's house this week uh in the first century or they met in somebody's house uh they met in uh, john mark's mother's house when peter came knocking at the door at midnight uh, uh certainly paul and silas in the philippian jail uh had turned that jail into a church they were singing songs of zion and the Holy Ghost shows up in there. So, so we're not talking, when you hear the word church, don't automatically think uh, an address on the corner of Miniville and Telegraph Road, okay? 
uh, if you need clarity, just ask, are you talking about local church or the invisible, the, the, the visible church or the invisible church? Are you talking about a brick and mortar building with pews and a, a pulpit in it? Or are you talking about the people when they assemble, even if they assemble outside under Bush Harbor, under Oak Grove, under the Oak Tree, down by the stream, down by the riverside, over there at, uh, at Shady Grove on Calvary's here, wherever they assemble, we can take the name of that place, but believe me, we are the church. This is what Paul is, is telling us, certainly as we enter the, as, as the church, you know, grew beyond Jerusalem, et cetera, and, and started to spread across the known world, um, uh, they, they, they established houses of worship or places where the, where the church assembled and the name kind of transferred from the people church to the building church, okay? But Paul doesn't have that second understanding here in this first century. So for Paul, when he talks about church, he's not talking about a building in, 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 in Jerusalem or a building in Macedonia or in Ephesus, even though there were, uh, there were assemblies, there were groups of people assemble, that would assemble themselves on the Lord's day and, and a sermon would be presented to them uh, according to the gospel, uh, no matter where they were assembled. But, um, but it wasn't a brick and mortar, um, uh, quote unquote, house at that time when Paul writes this. And so I want you to kind of understand that as Jacqueline is sharing with us, we're talking about the invisible church of which Christ is the head of that body, okay? So, uh, so, so nobody can be grandfathered into the church and none of us receive the Holy Spirit by passive, passive osmosis. We have to engage the Holy Spirit. This is what she used, she, Jacqueline reminded us, we're born into the, into the church. We're born by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of the Spirit of the water. We must be born again. We must confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that we are saved. And then we are part of that assembly. We're part of the body of Christ at that, as, as we make that confession. Faith alone, through Christ alone, because of grace alone. So each of us must trust Christ for him or herself, thus receive the spirit by faith. It's true for all of us. All of us have come into the family of God the same way, uh, through, through repentance, a profession of faith, okay? We repented of our sins, we confess the Lord Jesus Christ. We believed in the, uh, the, the, the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. And therefore we are, we called upon the name of the Lord and we are saved. Okay, now we are living the life as God's handiwork because he has molded us and shaped us as we saw in the ending verses of chapter one of, of this uh, book of Ephesians. Okay, so in addition to being reconciled with God and with each other, all those who believe in Christ have become part of one new humanity at peace with God. So what does this peace actually look like on a daily basis? What, what, what does it look like? And, and Swindoll again gives us some practical applications, some takeaways so that we can kind of put meat on our understanding and have a visual of what it is that we must accomplish. So Paul describes four things we all share because of our new relationship with one another. First, he says to us, our new relationship of peace manifests itself in equal and unhindered access to the Father by the Spirit. We all can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in a time of need. We find that in the book of Hebrews. Um, and, it's, and as Paul is repeating it here, 
uh, in so many words uh, in, in verse 18. That is, we both have access to the Father by this one spirit called the Holy Ghost. This may not seem like an important development to those who, those of us who have known com, uh, to, of us who have known common access to God for nearly 2,000 years, okay? Uh, but, but, but believe me, uh, uh, having uh, been outside the will of God, uh, certainly as Paul has described the Gentiles who were dead in trespasses and sin, now have a direct, unhindered, and equal access to God as does the Jews. Yeah, that is, that is something to celebrate. That even in Paul's day, however, this was an earth shattering change for both Jew and Gentile, because remember, the Jews had to go through the high priest, they could not go boldly uh, to the throne for, for on behalf of themselves. Okay, but God taught Jesus taught his disciples how to pray and gave us direct and unhindered access to the Father through the spirit. Jews could only access God through their high priest who entered God's presence on a, uh, once a year on the Day of Atonement, uh, Yom Kippur. Gentiles could only have access to God by converting to Judaism, thereby receiving circumcision and then following the laws as a Jew. Yet Christ's death tore the curtain in the temple from top to bottom, tore it in two, and the temple, the 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 the, um, the divider that separated the holies from the holy of holies, the coda from the kodashim, that that uh, that that uh, curtain, uh, from what I understand, was something like three and a half to four inches thick of woven wool, uh, lamb's wool. And, and died uh, and processed a certain way, et cetera, uh, that gave it this huge um, um, uh, dividing mechanism from, from, from the holies, from the holies of holies. That thing was torn, impossible to be torn by humans <laughs> because of the manner in which it was constructed. But the Bible says that it was torn from top to bottom, which meant that God did the tearing. Okay, um, and uh, um, uh, demonstrating that in Christ, all believers have access, direct access to God, not just the priests on, on the Day of Atonement, but any and all can come into the Holies of Holies. You, 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 in fact, you now have the authority to make your own altar wherever you worship your God, and that altar in your home is, is your direct access, access to God, okay? So through Christ, we both have access by the, by the one spirit to the Father. So here we see the work of the triune God in the plan of reconciliation. We have access to God the Father through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because of the work of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad about that? So now we can come freely and directly to God in prayer for all of our needs. No more priests uh, for that purpose, no more complex rituals, no more fear that we might be consumed by his holy wrath, <laughs> which is always a threat. I wouldn't. I wouldn't come before God now unclean anyway, but rather we have a common access to God's presence that is free and complete, granted to all who believe. Second of those four things Paul explained is that the peace we have in Christ confers on us a citizenship among the saints. That's what he's saying in verse 19. He says, consequently, we're no longer foreigners and strangers, but we're now fellow citizens. 
That is the Gentiles have once been foreigners who had no rights or privilege among the people of God, that in Christ they became fellow citizens with the saints. Okay, here Paul is referring specifically to Old Testament saints, those with whom Gentiles formerly had nothing in common. Now though, as, as, as saints themselves, Gentile believers are on an equal standing with the great patriarchs and the prophets of old. We now stand with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Elisha, et cetera, et cetera. We're in a, we have a great cloud of witnesses. What a great company to be among. Aren't you glad about that? So therefore, whenever you feel unloved, whenever you feel unimportant, whenever you are feeling insecure, remember to whom you belong. Hallelujah, you are a citizen of the, of, of the kingdom, a, a child of the most high God. Thirdly, he said, Paul tells us that we relate to each other as a family as fellow members of God's household. Again, not only fellow, fellow citizens with God's people, but he says we're also members of God's household. Good God from Zion, you live in the house with God. In the New Testament, the household referred to all those living under the same roof, so to speak. It often included more than what we call the nuclear family. It might include parents, children, grandparents, grown sons with their own wives and children, even aunts and uncles, okay? We are all in God's family. In other words, it included the extended family. And even in this day and age, I would even add the blended family. This is a great picture of the new family of God, united under one father through the person of Jesus Christ and held together by the bonds of the Holy Spirit. Aren't you glad about that? That we're all welcome at the table, that we're all the same in the eyes of God. No more Jew, Gentile, male, female, rich, rich or poor, we all have unfeathered access and that we're all related. Why? Because there's peace at the table with Christ. Though all of us know, the, know that most families deal with some level of dysfunction, <laughs> the church family should strive to live together as loving brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of the differences in our racial social, economical or economic and cultural backgrounds. This kind of community life brings great benefit to everyone. Hallelujah. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that shall be. That when we all see Jesus, we shall sing and shout victory for we shall all sit down together at the table where christ said i will not eat again until we're all together assembled again in that new jerusalem and that christ himself who sits at the head of the table and as the king of kings and lord of lords as we crown him calling forth the royal diadem and we crown him king of kings hallelujah and we all are, are are equal with christ at the table that we are able to fellowship with him amen in that great beyond it provides us with a caring network of support that goes far beyond that of friend and neighbor. 
Being in the family of God, it gives us a place for mutual accountability and growth. It gives us an opportunity to exercise our spiritual gifts for the benefit of all. And it also provides a beautiful example of love for those outside the Christian faith looking in. We tell them, come to the table, come as you are, come to the fountain, come. Amen. The Lord is tenderly calling you into the family of God. Finally, Paul reveals that Jews and Gentiles today have a common faith that brings them, amen, eternal joy. Notice here, Paul uses the image of the temple building to describe the Christian faith community into which both Jews and Gentiles are welcome. No, no courts of the Gentiles in the, in the, as, as it was in, in, in Solomon's temple. No court of the women, amen. There is no separation of, of races or sexes. Uh, we all are welcome together in, in common faith in the Lord. The foundation of the building consists of the teachings of the New Testament apostles and prophets who laid this foundation for us that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of the living God with the person and work of Christ himself who finished all of that work of our salvation. Amen. On the cross of Calvary, he has now become the cornerstone of this new structure. Amen. Whether you call it the new, new temple or you call it the body of Christ, the church, it is new in that Christ is the, that joins it together. It is he, this building that is fitly framed together, uh, growing uh, unto a holy temple in the Lord, a dwelling place. The word temple, uh, similar to the word tabernacle, amen, uh, to dwell with, a place where we know God will reside and we're going to God's house. The temple is God's uh, place of, uh, of abode. And, uh, and, and so is this new church, uh, this new body of Christ. All believers are, are coming into this body aboding, uh, uh, residing and existing in the body of Christ. Uh, uh, hallelujah. In the first century, while the New Testament was still being written by those apostles and prophets, the foundation consisted of their teachings from the Old Testament and their eyewitness accounts, not to mention the small but growing number of writings that became part of our New Testament. Even as Paul was closing out uh, 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 his life, uh, he had written those 27 books that would become the, 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 the majority foundation of the New Testament. And John, who wrote both a gospel, three, three letters, three epistles, and the book of Revelation, and I, I added to uh, the three other uh, uh, gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, uh, and Luke. Uh, again, the T New Testament uh, the, the foundation that tells us who we are and whose we are and how to conduct ourselves in this body. Why? Because Christ is the chief cornerstone. Therefore, today, my brothers and sisters, we have direct access to all of the inspired writings of both the Old and New Testament, both of which point to Jesus as Christ, as the center, and as our standard of truth. And as God calls each of us from our various backgrounds, God fits us together as stones in this temple. We are lively stones in the temple, fitted uh, 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 together, amen, that we are fitly framed together. <laughs> Uh, 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 establishing on the foundation of what the apostles and the prophets, that becomes the foundation with Christ now being the, the upper right structure 
uh, once that cornerstone is laid, the building's uh, uh, length and breadth is 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 pronounced to be square, uh, and that that building will not lean, uh, uh, nor will it, it it will it will take its its rightful shape, uh, because the cornerstone is set straight. Amen. And that this living building is no mere gathering of like-minded believers, but rather it is a holy temple, a place where God himself abodes, as it is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit that lives and abides among the people whose responsibility it is to, as we invoke him on Sunday morning, he usher us into the presence of the Lord himself as we come to the house of God, amen. God himself, amen, receives us into his own house and we celebrate him and his son, Jesus Christ, for what they have given us. Though he doesn't use the word here, Paul is referring to the church, that is the body of Christ, which is not a literal building or an earthly corporation, but rather a living organism, a living community of faith resting squarely on the Holy Scriptures, and it is centered intently on Jesus Christ. God doesn't give up on his people. He will come and see about us, even in the midst of all that we're going through. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead us, guide us, and ever direct us that we might come out of this turmoil and this confusion that we live through now, that we may become the people you're calling us to become. In the marvelous name of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray God's people said, amen. If the Lord says the same, we will begin chapter three on next uh, Wednesday, the 1st of June. Good Lord, it is ticking away, y'all. <laughs> We've been at this thing a few. Uh, and um, we'll talk about the mystery, the ministry, and Paul is referring to himself as the me. Praise the Lord. Jacqueline, if you would uh, stop our recording.